for tonight, so we won't be taking any call-ins. Uh, it's a pre-recorded program, so sit back and enjoy the conversation. Each year, Women for Progress Radio, at the end of the year, we have a round table discussion with a diverse group of women about the issues and the events that happened in the previous year. And this year, uh, we have decided to add a part two to that particular conversation round table. So I'm very, very excited uh, tonight to uh, bring together a diverse group of women who are great leaders and trailblazers in their particular industry and the areas that they come from. And uh, I'm excited about our conversation tonight. So our first um, uh, guest is Ms. Kamisha Brown Mumford, who is a native of Canton, Mississippi. Kamisha uh, received her bachelor's degree in political science with a concentration in women's studies from Mississippi State University and her Juris Doctorate from Mississippi College School of Law in 2007. She has been licensed to practice law in Mississippi since 2007 and licensed to practice law in Louisiana since 2012. Kamisha is presently employed as Senior Corporate Counsel of USSS LLC, where she specializes in real property and tax. In 2013, Kamisha was appointed Municipal Court Judge for the City of Canton and is now serving her second term in that position. She was elected by her fellow Municipal Court Judges as President of Mississippi Municipal Judges Association in June of 2017 and is a member of the DUI Information Exchange Advisory Commission. Kamisha is very active involved in the community. She serves on the Board of Directors for Dress for Success Metro Jackson as President and General Counsel. She is a 2010 graduate of Leadership Madison County and a 2013 graduate of Leadership Greater Jackson. In 2013, she was selected as one of Mississippi's 50 leading businesswomen. Kamisha lives in Jackson, Mississippi with her husband, our new Hines County attorney, Mr. Jared Mumford, and her children, Garrison Four and Gianna Five Months. Welcome to the show, Kamisha. Thank you so much for having me, Willie. I'm excited to be here. Great. And we have Ms. Tamichis E. Hodges, is a native of Jackson, Mississippi, where she obtained her Jewish, Doctor of Jurisprudence from Mississippi College School of Law. After graduating and passing the Mississippi Bar, Demetrius worked for Morgan & Morgan LLC in Jackson until opening her own practice, Hodges Children's Law. Proud to obtaining her Doctor of Jurisprudence, Demetrius graduated from Denison University in Granville, Ohio. Today, Demetrius is representing everyday citizens from different walks of life in the areas of workman's comp, family law, and criminal law. No matter the size of a client's case, every client receives relatable, trustworthy, and professional legal services. Welcome to the table, Ms. Hodges. Thank you. And we, we did not mention she has an exciting business, and we'll maybe talk about that a little <laughs> bit later, too. Also at the table with us, we have Ms. L. Quinn Brayboy, is a civil engineer working at a private consulting firm in downtown Jackson. She is a Jackson native, graduating from Murrah High School. She then attended the United States Military Academy for two years and transferred to Mississippi State University to complete her bachelor's in civil engineering. While there, she interned with a company, IMS Engineers, where she worked for over eight years after graduation. After some years of experience, she decided to further her education at Jackson State University to receive her master's in civil engineering, graduating in fall of 2013. Currently, Quinn continues civil engineering work at SOL Engineering Services as a project engineer. Welcome to the show, Ms. Brayboy. Thank you for having me. And we have our uh, member, Ms. Teresa. Kennedy, who's joined us and always a part of Women for Progress Radio. She's, of course, a very, very proud alumni of Alcorn State University, where she was a part of the 2001 SWAC Women's Tennis Champion Team and initiated into Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc. Upon graduating with a Bachelor's in Business Administration and a Master's in Agriculture Economics from Alcorn State University, Teresa has worked in the area of agricultural entrepreneurship, banking, political campaigns, small business consulting, city government, community outreach, and marketing. Each experience has been a blessing, she says. 
She's been also a trailblazer in her own right. She started Red August, an online retail site in 2010. Her passion for serving continued as she named Deputy Director of Marketing for the City of Jackson and created the city's first magazine, We Are Jackson. Teresa is a 2015 graduate of Leadership Greater Jackson, active in Metro Jackson Alcorn Alumni Chapter as a fundraising chair, a board member of Jackson Professional Group, a young professional professionals organization, a member of Team Jackson Steering Committee, and a member of the New Jerusalem Church. Also, she's a member of Women for Progress and a regular guest host with Women for Progress Radio on WMPMR. WMPR 90.1 on Thursdays. She has been an active tennis player in the local tennis league for over 10 years. She was named J. Jackson Free Press Person of the Day twice in 2010 and 2017. Although she was unsuccessful in her recent run for state office, Teresa has shared that because of her positive experience that she may give it a try again. And recently she served as the director of the Women's Business Center of Mississippi, an organization that assists women, women ent entrepreneurs and small business owners with starting or growing their businesses. Welcome to the show again, Teresa. Welcome. Thank you. I, I tell you, you women do so much and it's always exciting uh, for Women for Progress to sit, sit down to the table to uh, all the wonderful women that are in our state. And some of these bios, I probably would take us this hour and a half uh, to, uh, to go through everything that you all do, and you do so much. And I want to say, starting off, that we appreciate what you offer to our community and giving your talents and resources to our community. And we love the idea that you're sitting with us today on Women for Progress Radio. Okay, we've opened a new year and it has launched and it seems like every year is dubbed a year like no other. But 2017 truly was a more dramatic than many others in recent memory. In the last 12 months, we faced a renewed threat of nuclear war, debated whether to take a knee during the national anthem and resisted the temptation to look at the sun during the total solar eclipse. From increased tensions with North Korea to a hurricane season unlike any other, to the bombshell allegations of sexual misconduct in Hollywood and beyond. Again, we will take a look at the key moments of 2017. And I would like to start with a few of the, uh, the questions that I asked our previous round table, because I'd like to give you, get uh, 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 some additional responses from that. And of course, uh, President Obama and the First Lady left the White House, and we had a new president that was sworn in as the fourth president of the United States on January 20th, outlining his vision of a new national populism and reiterating the same America First mantra that delivered the White House to him during the 2016 election. In his first address as leader of the free world, Trump said his inauguration would signify an historic moment when the forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. What has this new era of governing on the national and international level meant to you? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying um, what it's meant to me is, is, is definitely opened up the door for a lot of people to be a, totally be public, you know, publicly express themselves about their views. Um, I think a lot of people have been in the closet and it's, it's somewhat been somewhat, we know where a lot of people stand now and they've been very vocal about where they stand and, you know, it helps us better determine, you know, how we move about and what we need to do better more of and in terms of going forward and how we need to be more strategic. and and. You know, and even turning out the vote, this election taught us um, staying at home really is just not an option for us. When that person isn't on the ballot, you know, staying at home just isn't an option for us. We still have to go vote. And, and, and the result of not voting is pretty much can, can really alter our everyday lives dramatically. Our vote counts when we go to the poll, and our vote counts when it, we don't go to the poll, because it, it counts in a negative way when we don't go to the poll. Ms. Okay. Kanisha? I, I think, too, we all got very comfortable with the election of 44, mm -hmm. President Obama. Mm -hmm. We were thinking, you know, race relations in this country are great. You know, mm -hmm. we elected a black president. We have two black children in the White House mm -hmm. and a wonderful black first lady. And then we elect 45. Mm -hmm. Some of us elected him by not going to the 
to the polls to vote, right. like you said. Um, and so now we're having these very honest conversations mm -hmm. about how people truly feel. Uh, if nothing else, it should help us all realize that there's still more work to do, mm -hmm. um, that we have not evolved mm -hmm. into uh, all humans matter right. uh, as we should, uh, and that a black life is worth the same and as much as any other life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've seen that more now over this last year uh, than anything, that people are being very honest about how they feel, uh, even if the way that they feel hurts their brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, it should help us have more honest conversations and really move towards uh, living a life where we value all human beings. Mm -hmm. And it also brought forth um, to like how the country still deems, uh, well, how the country is still not ready for female leadership in all areas of government. Because um, even here in Mississippi, when we had um, a, a female to run for governor, she was a lawyer, well clouded got beat by a truck driver somehow that right. no one even knew and so that just let us know then as a small on a smaller scale hey Mississippi wasn't ready so I thought maybe perhaps the entire you know the collective United States where the where the United States would be ready for a woman and like no we'd rather mm -hmm. have a man despite whatever his qualifications may be or lack thereof. Quinn? Um, I agree. I know Teresa brought up strategic. I just thought about how you said we did get comfortable over the last eight years and some of the population was planning and plotting, you know, in a sense, uh, to kind of the whole thing, make America great again and things like that. And then that coded language too. Because mm -hmm. you hear make America great again and you think, oh yeah, we want to make America great again. We are in America, but you have to realize the connotations behind it. Like, mm -hmm. that's not what, you know, quite that they use that saying. Right. It's not positive, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think what I'm hearing now too, and I, I was going to bring this up later, but I think this is a perfect opportunity to, is talk about the status of women. And I'm hearing from men that because of everything that is happening political, um, that it is now time or we're at a time where we need more women in political leadership. Mm -hmm. That that is the thing, because when we think about all of the issues that, that we dealt with in 2017, and I think we have become very, very divided because of this uh, in this past year. Um, and so people are saying maybe now that we need women at the table and at leadership, and that is going to be the fix that's going to change and flip this thing. So how, where do you all think we are as women? Are more women ready to take the reins? And then how do we support women uh, in these roles? Because we know that women have a mountain and a hill to climb that men do not. Mm -hmm. I, I think first and foremost, we as women have to realize that we have the juice. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we have that thing that, I mean, look at Alabama, and I know we, mm -hmm. I may be jumping no, ahead, ahead, but that Senate race in Alabama was decided yeah. by women. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we have all this power to influence, uh, to get the job done, to cross over and get people to see things differently than they normally would. We just have to tap into the talents that we right. have and, and really be courageous. I think a lot of women, even mm. me myself sometimes, I don't do things out of fear. Um, and I think in 2018, we let that go and just live our best lives. Mm -hmm. um, because when women do things, we impact not only our immediate families, but our whole community and the world for the better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just think we have to, number one, realize our power. Yeah. Um, and then act on it. Mm -hmm. And support each other. Mm -hmm. Quinn? Yes, definitely supporting each other because I guess speaking from a um, personal standpoint, I'm in a male-dominated field, so when I do see another female engineer and then a minority female engineer, I'm like, oh, you know, you kind of like latch to them to, as a mentor. So I think being open as a mentor and then also being a mentee, learning from fellow women, especially black women, it's good to see someone who looks like you and then you're like, oh, they're going the direction that I would like to go in. So as far as like with polit um, politics, as far as like black women who've already ran or maybe in the past, you can kind of look to them for guidance on what they learned, you know, while they were running or going through um, various things. So that would be a good thing for, for you to, I guess, focus on getting the, their past experiences. 
Okay, you've been listening to uh, the Women for Progress radio uh, network, and I have with me in the studio, this is a pre-recorded program, uh, Ms. Uh, Kamisha Mumford, Ms. Tamichis Hodges, Ms. Quinn Brayboy, and Ms. Teresa Kennedy, and we're having a roundtable discussion on the issues that impact us in 2017 and how do we move forward in 2018. And uh, we're talking now uh, about more women in political leadership. And Demetrius? Another thing with um, helping women move forward in political leadership is money. Money is a, a big mm. deal. You know, it's nothing for a man to go out and ask for money. You know, men just have that confidence when it comes to a few things. They're going to go out and ask for the money, and they're going to get the bag from their friends. Um, but when women, of course, we don't like to ask for help. And so if we'd be more open to asking for help and then also garnering the support of the ma of the men as well and right. who they know can help us get the money, that would be a great help because you really can't run for office without the bag. Right. Yeah. And, and in addition to, I mean, I totally agree with everything y'all said. In addition to that, you know, um, we got to do a better job of supporting one another. Mm -hmm. when, when we know a quality woman um, is running for an office, you know, we really have to step up and, and, and support her, not just from a distance. You know, sometimes it may be you talking one-on-one -on -one with your corner, your, your uh, circle of friends. Um, and that's something, you know, we talk a lot about this with women in Women for Progress, about how do we move the needle about getting more women into office and, and getting more women to run. Because like Kamisha said, um, you know, women have that juice you know we we already a lot of us are already serving in leadership roles uh, whether it's pta or um at our church or um in certain civic organizations you know we have that experience and sometimes it just uh, we just need to be some people want to be asked some people just need to be tapped on the shoulder and some people definitely need to be uh you know brought up and 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 and, and with the intent that this is where we're going um I know we'll probably talk about this later on, but I wanted while we're talking about women in politics, you know, the other night I was thinking about how many women we have, um, how pockets of women. Well, I'll say this: how many pe black people that we have in just in the legislature, and like the Delta, for instance. I was thinking about how the Delta has quite a few bit of representation, black representation, but. I don't know any woman out of the Delta, but maybe one um, that's black, black, one black woman out of the Delta that's representing, you know, representing us in the legislature. And, you know, I know there are plenty of women in Greenville and Greenwood and Clarksdale um, that are serving in leadership positions, but just have not taken that leap into wanting to, you know, serve on that level. Um, and then, you know, now in 2017 was a big, big, big historic year for a lot of black women um, on the municipal level. Um, we've seen two uh, women get elected in two major southern cities in Atlanta and New Orleans. Um, we were talking about this earlier, one named Keisha, mm -hmm. you know, Keisha Lance Bottoms <laughs> in Atlanta and the other one named Latoya yeah. in, in New Orleans. And so, you know, I, if you read a little bit of their bio, you know, these women are... Uh, Keisha's an attorney, um, started out, very impressive how she started out, and, you know, she worked her way up through the ranks, and she was mentioned in her uh, swearing-in yesterday speech that she's the first person to ever serve all three areas of government. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I look at, I read a little bit about Latoya Cantrell down in New Orleans, and, you know, she moved, she was, she was an import to New Orleans, so she's the first person uh, to be elected in New Orleans that's not a native of New Orleans. Mm. And uh, she came there, moved there with her grandmother, went to Xavier. Uh, but these women were able to garner the support outside the black community, and that's something that we probably hit on at some point too, um, and got people to support them financially, like Tamitra said, uh, support them, just sisters coming together. Um, and that's something that we hadn't really seen happen here in, in the state of Mississippi with black women. But also, Teresa, you mentioned a lot of things. Um, you, you talked about uh, uh, like these women were from, they were qualified, of course, and then they were prepared women. And, um, and, and, and as Kamisha said, they had courage. It was obvious based on the type of women they were. 
But also, we, we, you know, it, it sounds good, and we say it a lot. Gosh, I hear it so many times from even our show and our dialogues when we say we got to support women, and, you know, it sounds good, and we're in the middle of sitting and talking at lunch, and we say, yeah, yeah, we got to do this. But as we move forward to 2018, and, 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 I'm, and I'm going to stop conversations as we move forward to 2018, because when we start chanting this and saying we got to support women, I'm going to say, okay, how do we do that? What is the strategy for that to happen? Of course, we need, and you mentioned one already, we have to start talking to our very, very young girls about uh, political leadership and how we need them and make sure that we empower them, give them the courage and support they need, and talk to them as young girls to say, you need to support your young friend. You're, you need to support her in the every day of play, in the every day of encouraging each other. But then as we, as leaders in our own particular arena, how do we move forward in 2018? Because now there's a momentum happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not something that's just some rare phenomenon. Um, I mean, we, I'm going to read a, a little excerpt from a, a New Yorker magazine that's really uh, exciting. Uh, in, in a, and I say to people to go and read it because it's very interesting. But uh, we need to say specifically how we're going to engage in a strategy that will get women to where they need to be and support women needs to be. And Demetrius hit a big, big button is money. Mm -hmm. we, we have, women have got to have money, and they can't have just $25 or $5 here. We need to figure out, and I think it, it comes for us mentally first. We have mm -hmm. to set our mindset is how we're going to support women, and specifically black women. Because that, that's when it comes to fundraising and us opening up our pocketbooks. Um, we need to uh, say to ourselves that we are going, when we have a black woman who is running for office, who is prepared, who is qualified for the position, that we're going to give not only our voices to her, not only our resource, other resources to her and share her story, but we're going to open our pocketbook and we're going to help her. And if we don't have the money, where, how can I look to others to help give her mo this money? So I want to talk about strategy and let's talk about just a few things uh, to share with our audience and the other women that might be listening on how we can make that happen. Well, I'll say, um, from my experience, not just working campaigns, but even running for office, the power of relationships. Um, you know, yes, money is a very big deal in any campaign, and but I also realize your network of people has a value to it as well. Um, I had one person who is a very big supporter of mine, in kind me, you know, uh, radio time that she already had with her business, you know, that was a huge help to me. Um, I had people who invited me to events to speak. Um, that was a huge help. You know, they, they were just trying to get me in front of people so that more people could know who I was. Uh, sharing posts on social media. You know, people think that is 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 they you know if it, if it, if they can't write you a check then there's nothing they can do. But there there are a lot of little small things that can be done that really have a big impact. And I'm sure Tamisha has seen. I mean, not Tamisha. Uh, Kamisha has seen that in her experience with several campaigns that she's been a yeah. part of. Yeah, I I think too for us with getting women elected, we have got to organize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it all starts with organizing. You know, we know all the races that are going to come up. Now, one of the things that I did, and, 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 and I hope this isn't a shameless plug, but <laughs> one of my, not resolutions, but something that I've made my business to do going into 2018 was to become a member of Women for Progress. Great. Mm -hmm. Because I thought, if I'm going to really be a part of promoting women, then I need to be in this group that is trying to get women more politically involved and not just involved to say, hey, let's push all of our ladies to go and vote for right. some man. Right. Know, my husband was one of those <laughs> men. <I'm like, laughs> so like but to put a woman on the ballot and see her through to election. Right. Uh, and I think we do that by organizing. I think back to my college days when we wanted to have a black homecoming queen at Mississippi State. What we all did was we had a meeting and we said, we're putting this person up. And we're all going to support this person. And she won. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to start thinking in that, 
in that realm of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if we can pull all of our support to this one person and say, look, you know, you're interested in this. We mm -hmm. all we know you're capable. We know you're qualified. We know you're going to do a good job. We are all here to support mm -hmm. you. And then we go out to our networks and say, okay, Kamisha, what can you do? to support Jane as she runs for this office. Yes. And then we all just pull together. Because as women, we do have all these talents, but we have children and, and careers and mm -hmm. families that need us. And sometimes, and I'm guilty of it too, we say, oh yeah, I'm going to support Teresa. And then we look around and the election is over. Right. And we haven't done enough mm -hmm. to offer that support. But I think if we are tuned into some group where I know I'm going to get an email from Ms. Willie to say... Yes. Here's a reminder, we need to do this, then I'm more likely to go ahead and do yeah. what I need to do. Even, and it doesn't take us a long amount mm -hmm. of time. It just takes us being intentional right. mm -hmm. about yeah. what we do. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think if we kind of get to that point to where we're saying, all right, we know these elections are coming up, who do we have? Yeah. Do we have anyone? Mm -hmm. If we don't have anyone, let's go and pull some young Kamisha yeah. Mulford <laughs> yeah. from the comfort of her office right. and say, you need to do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and once we motivate people in that way, because most there are several women in our community that have that desire yeah. to serve, um, but they're not sure if they're going to have the support. And so mm -hmm. what a blessing would it be if we can identify them and go say, right. hey, it's yeah. your turn. That's yeah. it. We, we, we definitely had that conversation several <laughs> yeah. times. Kamisha, you're hitting the nail on the head. Yeah. So we're excited to have you join us so we can <laughs> get this ball rolling. Yeah. And I want to say, too, the, the Miss Dorothy Stewart, when she um, created this vehicle for us, Women for Progress, one of the concepts that has worked for now almost 40 years is that all the women that come together within Women for Progress, everybody gives their piece of the pie. And that's what makes the whole. Because we know that we are women who are mothers and who are grandmothers, who are business owners, who are educators, who are uh, uh, grandparents, and all of these things that we have to do. So everyone has a little piece of time. And some of us who say, well, I don't have the time, but I got a few dollars. I don't have the time, but when you need me, I'll make the necessary phone calls to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So if all of us comes together, and we know that, that, that there's a lot of work to be done. But if everybody comes together and puts their particular uh, a quarter on the table, we can make it work. We can make it happen. We know it works because this organization has been around for almost 40 years, and it's that, it is that foundation that has worked and it's been beneficial, and it has not been a, it been an opportunity where we have had to reinvent reinvent that wheel. So uh, I appreciate you saying that uh, and giving Women for Progress the plug. And Ms. Brayboy? Um, I was going to kind of piggyback off what Teresa said with the networking, because I guess I don't, I may, I thought about like me, I might not, you know, know as many people, but I might work for someone who I feel like will support that candidate. Mm -hmm. Or I'm a church member. I can go to my church. You know, different organizations that like you're saying you're a part of. And just reaching out the extension of, I have a relationship with you, but my relationship with others, I can influence them, like you're saying, and influence your community to support that woman. Then I was just, your question was good because I was thinking, like, the strategy, like you said, I just, I don't know, my brain was just kind of spinning, like, how can you support more women? Mm -hmm. And like you're saying, using those various resources, but money is also, you know, a good thing too because a lot of things do take money, but mm -hmm. resources can be, you can get creative with using your resources to help the candidate. Okay, to be interested. Yeah, and you brought up what I wanted to uh, touch on, Willie, when it comes to time. Mm -hmm. Um, because you'll have the money, but yeah. when will you have time to knock on doors and yeah. make shirts and buttons and yeah. kiss the babies, shake the hands, and put hand Do sanitizer on? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you, it takes a team of people who mm -hmm. are going to be dedicated to the candidate to step out with her at all yeah. times um, to make her known. You know, even though people will be out spreading the word, mm -hmm. the, the candidate still needs a face. Yeah. And she'll need to be able to get around, and people need to be wearing her paraphernalia and just really spending that time with the candidate yeah. and, and I say too we have to talk to talk and we have to we have to walk to walk and we have to walk that same walk and have that same dialogue uh, when we support each other and I want to say when I talk about changing the mindset 
The other thing is about um, getting to love each other as women, and especially African American mm-hmm. women. And when I say love each other, we are so diverse. Mm-hmm. To love that diversity. Uh, all of us can't make $200,000 a year that I value at $200,000 a year or whether you're making $30,000 a year is the same, mm-hmm. that we're all beautiful. And, and if we think about each, each other as women, and I think about this all the time and I get chills about it because I do believe that there's a movement that's getting ready to happen. We're wearing our natural hair now. Mm-hmm. We're, we're taking care of ourselves and we're, we're unifying. There's so many different organizations that are popping up now to empower each other as women. So I think as we begin to continue to really accept each other as what we are, understand that we each have an individual power that is unique and that we together, we take all of those resources, all of our talents, and all of that beauty together, that we, that's when we can really, really make it happen. Because all those voices that are beyond us, that are out there in society, that's on the media, and telling us uh, you know, what we can and cannot do, when we come together in unison, all of those voices are shut out, and we can do what we need to do. Teresa? I was just gonna, and you're absolutely right, Willie. Um, I wanted to add to what Kamisha said about organizing, and um, I did listen to um, Keisha Lance Bottoms, uh, (laughs) her celebratory speech the night she was confirmed as the winner, and one of the things she talked about was, you know, she started out with just, you know, four people, her and three other people sitting around her kitchen table, and, you know, to think of a city as large as Atlanta and to hear, you know, you think she probably sat down in this conference room with all these people. You know, she sat down with, she said, three people. And even her campaign manager was someone who had never run a campaign before. You know, you know it had to be some organizing to really take, to, you know, take off with that type of level of uh, campaign. Um, but that is going to be a, a huge part of it, um, organizing tapping people on the shoulder and and, yeah. and telling them that you know you're gonna have that support that you you, you need you think you need to, to run. And uh, you've been tuned in to the Women for Progress Radio and this is a pre recorded uh, round table discussion with a diverse group of local women and uh, we have Miss Teresa Kennedy, Miss uh, Quinn Brayboy, Miss Teresa Hodges and Ms. Kamisha Mumford, who's joined the conversation today. And of course, I'm Willie Jones, president of Women for Progress. Um, And thank you for tuning in to WMPR tonight. Uh, I want to move forward by, and I know that this is going to take some of our conversation, but I think this is a, uh, I'm going to ask probably a different way than I asked the last roundtable. But in early October, back-to-back bombshell reports in the New York Times The New Yorker revealed that film mogul Harvey Weinstein allegedly lured women into hotel rooms and bars and sexually harassed or assaulted them in what some have described as an open secret known for years in Hollywood. Personal stories of being the victims of sexual harassment or assault, all using the hashtag MeToo. Weinstein's downfall has seemingly emboldened others to come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against prominent men. In recent months alone, at least 30 powerful men in entertainment business, politics, and the news media have been publicly condemned for their alleged sexual misconduct, and many have lost their jobs as a result, including Weinstein. The silence breakers of the Me Too movement who gave a voice to sexual harassment and harassment survivors have since been named Time Magazine's 2017 Person of the Year. This was a huge explosive event uh, for 2017 and took up a large part of the year. Um, And the conversation still continues. Um, What was that? uh, I'll, I'll ask the question, how was this particular topic and issue impacted our community and even our world? has people talking again um, as far as um, sexual harassment in the workplace because we first saw this when it rocked the nation with Anita Hill um, and I believe Clarence Thomas when they just asked her like what was her work experience like when she worked with him and for her to tell them those things they dragged her into the meeting the public meeting and she had then she sparked a conversation regarding sexual harassment it died down 
and then now it's back and we're now seeing more repercussions regarding it. Okay. Yeah, I think the biggest impact now is that something's happening to these men when these allegations are made. In years past, you know, you'd hear some woman would come forward with her story and then it just go away mm -hmm. and nothing in the man's life would ever really change, mm -hmm. especially with high profile men. What we're seeing now is people are losing their jobs uh, and their lives are being changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's giving that generation of women the courage mm -hmm. to come forward, even if it's been years later. But what it's teaching our young girls is that when it happens, say something mm -hmm. and there is going to be some repercussion. Yeah. I think in the past it's been like you say something you're probably going to lose your job. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so you better keep quiet and work your way up and just deal with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I think our girls will see okay if, if something happens I can say something and then I can expect some result. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the biggest takeaway from all of this. You know I've seen on social media people saying well she waited so many years mm -hmm. before saying something, but the, does that change that this was a wrong thing that happened mm -hmm. to someone? And these are all allegations mm -hmm. uh, for at this point in time, but uh, we've lived in a society, I think, for too long that would, you know, just kind of look the other way when it came to women working um, and these professions that were mostly male-driven. Um, and so when you have that, then sometimes things will happen, but you have to have women feel comfortable to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and now as we get that, those stories, we'll educate our younger women, uh, we'll give a voice to these people who've suffered in silence for so many years, um, and then send a message to men uh, that you need to treat all women with respect mm -hmm. and value. I totally agree with that, Kamisha. Um, you know, the last round table that we had, one of the ladies that was there mentioned that she had been um, sexually assaulted, and she didn't say anything for many years. And she, she talked about something I, I think a lot of us don't talk about is the shame, the guilt, um, the embarrassment, because a lot of people oftentimes, you know, rather than supporting the victim, they're often criticized and you know and she talked about that as well and you know it was an eye opener because you know I've had the conversation with friends and friends have said well why did they take so long to say something and you know her response was you know you know I, I was ashamed I was I was embarrassed and I was afraid and, you know and like you said she she feared her job and she feared you know what, what other people would say about her and so um, now that more people are speaking out about it and, and have this somewhat comfort of saying it um, and knowing that there will be some repercussions, there will be some recourse, there is more, I, you know, I applaud those women because it definitely takes courage, I, yeah. I would think, to, to, you know, to come out and say something. Right. Yeah. Yes. It takes a lot of courage and then, um, as you were saying about the younger generation, I think it's very important to young girls and young guys, young boys, so they'll know that this behavior is not acceptable. It's not just, you know, oh, this is what guys do. No, it's not acceptable. You need to respect, you know, women. And they're learning, they're seeing at a younger, at a younger age and past generations that, you know, there will be repercussions. You might lose your job. And then also, um, like you say, the courage of the woman to say something. Because most of the time, they, they, it boils down to, I, think, I don't think anyone will believe me. Okay. So it's just... The trauma that they have experienced is good that um, the media and women and men are there to support them and, you know. Well, Kamisha so. said something, too, um, that kind of ties the two together. You know, oftentimes it's been men, the men have been in the leadership positions, but now women have been breaking ceilings and tra blazing trails and, you know, there are a lot more women serving in leadership capacities now than ever before. And so now it's not just a room full of men talking, you know, right. yeah, making the decisions. Mm -hmm. There's some women in there now, and you know, all that, all things have to be considered now, yeah. you know, and especially if you don't want a lawsuit, your lawyers know about that. <laughs> I want to bring right. two points up on the other side, um, and I think we know that these things have existed for for quite a while, and uh, and I think we have a lot of positive things coming out of this conversation. But I want to go back to uh, commissionment is what, how we're going to be talking to our young girls. 
And I, I'm going to talk about the other side. Last, the last round table that we had, uh, someone brought up a lot of questions um, on the other side of the table. We talked about courage and we talked about, of course, these men should not have done what they did if these allegations are true and all of these things. But I want to talk a little bit about our role as women and accountability for each other. And what I'm hearing, too, from conversations that I'm having with the first group of women also is there's a lot of things came up even with the Bill Cosby situation. We know that he was a married man. So a lot of questions asked is, well, uh, what about accountability for us as women? That what, why did this woman go to this man's apartment, this married man's apartment, and put herself in that situation? Not that he should have done what he should, did, but we're talking about women as we hold ourselves accountable and make sure that we uh, talk to our young girls about what situations we should be in, how should we respect to each other, how, how uh, we should even respect ourselves. even ourselves and in, 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 in even the state of marriage. Yes, if, you know, if a man, you know that a man is married to somebody, there's things and conversations you should not have. You shouldn't be going to lunch with a married man by yourself. Um, so all of these conversations, and it's difficult sometimes, I think, within this particular context, because everybody doesn't want to say we don't want to you know offend a particular woman because she was harassed or that type of thing but that conversation has to have as we move forward um, when we talk about you know, empowering women we have to be true to ourselves and we have to have that dialogue uh, so I want to talk a little just a little bit about that before we move forward I'll start because we were talking before we started about this book that I've read a few times, The Seat of the Soul. And that book, it talks a lot about intention. Mm -hmm. um, and so before you do anything, you should think about, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. As you said, about respecting ourselves and mm -hmm. even respecting the sanctity of marriage mm -hmm. for women. And we live in a society, I think, now where people kind of just do whatever makes mm -hmm. them happy. If mm -hmm. this makes me feel good, then I'll find a way to justify it. People use the Bible and say, judge not that you yeah. be not judged. Yeah. <laughs> but we have to teach our girls to have some values for mm -hmm. themselves and some confidence and support in themselves. But I think it all starts with something that you said a little bit early, earlier, which is us loving each other. Mm -hmm. um, because if you love Sally like you should, mm -hmm. I don't care how many advances Sally's husband makes towards you, mm -hmm. you're going to say, Sally is my sister. Mm -hmm. He's trash. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I, the, the love I have for my sister is not going to allow me to put myself in this situation. But it then comes to you saying, what is my intention? What do I expect to get mm -hmm, out of this thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, before we make any decisions? And that's one of the reasons why I really like that book. Because it makes you think about why you're even thinking about doing a certain thing. What is the cause and effect? Because sometimes we can say, well, this happened to me because of some third party thing. Mm -hmm. But what were your intentional mm -hmm. thoughts when you initially thought of doing this thing? And so right. I think if we get to the point where we teach our girls you have value, um, you need to have self-respect, uh, but you also need to love and respect your sister. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, then there are certain things that you don't have to worry right. about doing to any other woman mm -hmm. uh, that will also save you from certain situations. And yeah, so I think if we sure. can teach, I mean, I have a five-month-old, and I'm already talking to her. <laughs> she has no idea what I'm talking about. But we're already having these conversations about how she's to love and respect herself and love and respect her sisters. And yeah. so um, I think if we can do that for all of our young girls, even those girls that aren't our daughters, that right. we mentor and like, have the same conversations with girls in our church, mm -hmm. um, because they may or may not be having them at home, but if they mm -hmm. can look to me to say, well, Miss Kamisha said, yeah. then we're still affecting that generation of women. So I think if we can teach that and not kind of teach that, oh, if it makes you happy, mm -hmm. and that bothers me so much. Yeah. Oh, I'm pretty old school <laughs> on a lot of things, but I think if we can teach that more so than to just do whatever makes you happy at the mm -hmm. time, I think we'll get different results. Right. And we also have to work on teaching our girls to carry themselves um, in a certain way, like mm -hmm. in a very positive manner. Mm -hmm. um, that way, you know, sometimes the, the way in which you carry yourself attracts different things, be it negative or positive. So you definitely want to cut down on things because a lot of women, you know, 
when they do experience sexual harassment, they don't want to come forward because, of course, the first thing that happens is the attack of their character mm-hmm. um, or the attacks on how they've been dressed or how they carry on. This is the age of social media, so people go all through your social yeah. media mm-hmm. and find the, you wearing a swimsuit July 13th, 1987. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. That, that yeah. doesn't have anything to do with what happened. So. Right. Um, But if we teach our girls to care themselves in a good manner, to be well respected, that would definitely help to cut down on Mm -hmm. some of not to say that it would never happen. You could be wearing a trash bag all day, every day, and still experience sexual harassment. But if we carry ourselves in in a way that is, you know, brings glory to whatever God we serve or Mm -hmm. and bring um, positivity to ourselves, it will cut down a lot. Yeah. I was going to say something when you brought up intentions. It made me think about something I learned a while ago. Intentions versus perception. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, maybe your intentions do mean well, but I think sometimes you have to look outside of yourself, Mm -hmm. outside of your bubble. Like if you go to lunch with a married man. Mm -hmm. The perception. Yeah, the perception. You know, Mm -hmm. it could look like, oh, you know, you're flirting, and it could be something innocent, but Mm -hmm. it can be perceived by others as something in a negative way, and you wouldn't want to be seen in that light. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. A very good point. Um, I know in campaigns, one of the things that we always say is perception is reality. You know, because people do run with the smallest thing mm-hmm. and make it be something totally else. And it becomes, quote unquote, reality. And so um, I'm glad you mentioned that, Quinn, the, the, the difference between the two. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm working on with myself, not perception, yeah. just my intentions, you know, mm-hmm. how, although I mean, well, the way it's perceived by others may not be that. And so, um, I want to be certain that my intentions are clear and, and, and one that's so that the perception is definitely not mistaken mm-hmm. by people. Okay, we've been tuned in to the uh, Women for Progress radio show, pre-recorded program. Uh, so we're not taking any calls tonight. Uh, we're having a roundtable discussion with uh, some great women leadership here in the city of Jackson. Um, and we're talking about the issues that impact us in 2017 and uh, how can we do things differently for 2018. Um, and I, uh, I know our time is moving on, so I want to get a few more conversations in. This morning on the Working Woman Report, the second Women for Progress radio show that was launched in 2017, and it's a, the Working Woman Report is programming designed to illuminate the work of uh, women throughout the state of Mississippi. And I've been extremely excited about this particular program because it's bringing together Uh, women from all over the state of Mississippi uh, to spotlight how the work of women is impacting our state. And it's been awesome. We've we've really uh, grown very, very quickly. And I think that shows also where we are, where the status of women are. And um, and I think as we learn more and more how value, the value that women bring to this state and to this economy, and to our communities, it's, it's going to empower other women to, to, to do major and big things. Uh, so uh, this morning, we our conversation was uh, on health and wellness. Uh, we know that every time at the beginning of a new year, we start thinking about uh, losing weight, what we're going to do differently, how we're going to inspire each other, how we're going to do things differently in 2018. And so I'm sure all of us that are around the table tonight has thought about some things that they're going to focus on and do differently from 20. And I'd like you all to share some of those things that you think might help empower other women. Okay. Uh, <laughs> everyone looks at me. Um, work, I, I'd never really make resolutions, and I don't try to start the year off with, oh, I'm going to work out, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Um, mainly because fitness is my lifestyle, as I do own a fitness business. Um, so that's never really a big problem, but I do work with women each and every day. And um, I try to make sure we focus on a lot of different things because as women, um, working out, it's, it's more than just working out when it comes to women. Um, first, we have to be in the right head space because working out is part mental and that's something people don't realize. You have to get the mind right first to make the body do what you want it to do. Mm-hmm. And then once you get past making up in your mind what you want to do, then you have to get your body right. 
And the, of course, working out is a process. You know, you come in, you're like, I have this goal, I'm gonna try to lose this amount of pounds, but then you come to your first workout class or first week or even the first month, you're like, I'm too sore to move, don't even think about touching me to get my attention. Um, but you have to stick with it and go through the, the pain of it. And like I have to tell my students, um, well, my clients, I'm not a teacher, <laughs> but my clients that, you know, you have, it's like working out is like life. You just have mm -hmm. to get through the bad parts to get to the good parts. Right. You have those nice jeans you want to get into, come in here and get beat down a little bit and you'll be wearing those <laughs> jeans in no time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't make a resolution either for 2018, but there's something, my mom and I had a conversation on New Year's Eve um, and it really made me get up every morning with the thought that, I'm only blessed to be a blessing to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so every day, and I know we're only in the third day of 2018, mm -hmm. uh, but I've made a conscious effort to do something out of my way, in some way, to help someone else. And it's mostly been women. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's such little small things that you can do that will just kind of change a person's day or sometimes a week or a month for them. But I think if we are really cognizant of the needs of others, um, we can make a bigger impact on the lives of others. And, and so she, my mom was sharing with me, she said, you know, you have all that you have and have accomplished all that you've accomplished, not for plaques on the wall, not for that nice resume, but for you to go mm -hmm. and help somebody else. And mm -hmm. she challenged me. She said, every day you need to do something. And so when I get up in the morning, I immediately start praying like, Lord, please send somebody early today because I do not want to fail. <laughs> but I think even doing that and asking God to, to send us someone that we can help and, and just kind of even if you're in the McDonald's line or Starbucks line or whatever, you buy the meal ahead of you or something mm -hmm. that you think is small. And I see people post about those things on Facebook all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was in line right. and, you know, right. somebody paid for the meal for me, the car ahead of me, and I, and I didn't have any money or right. didn't, uh, that That's was my right. last $20 bill that I was getting. So you just never know. And, you know, it may be something small to you, but it can mean the world to someone else. So my biggest, my mantra for 18 is, you know, you're blessed to be a blessing. Great. Well, I would say I don't too much do the New Year's. I pretty much kind of do it on my birthday. Like when I get a year older, I reflect. So um, this past year, my things were to kind of simplify uh, just because I can kind of clutter and then even mentally clutter things. Yes. So I was going to simplify some things in my life. So I thought that would be good to just be in a better mental space, just kind of take away unnecessary things. And then that way you can be... I kind of build on what you're saying, like be a, a blessing to someone else because you're in a you're in a more positive uh, space to help others. And the uh, other one was also I was thinking what you said, like no pain, no gain, just sticking to a goal and not giving up when it does get hard. Because sometimes mm -hmm. I know that sounds a little cliche, but you always have like those moments you're like, oh, why did I start this? Or why did I like, oh, I didn't think it was gonna be this hard, but you just. But once you get to the end of it, you're like, oh, I'm so glad I stuck with it. I'm yeah. so proud of myself. Or, you know, or if it's like a team effort, like, I'm so proud of the team. We got through this. So that accomplishment is just so much better when you can share it with, you know, your people, your community, your world. Yeah. And I've mentioned this last time, and it's still true this week, too. <laughs> so I survived. <laughs> I've, I've, I've survived two weeks. <laughs> But, you know, being more disciplined in my finances, you know, mm -hmm. I do a lot of frivolous oh spending. And and being a single person and you just living it. alone, yeah. I eat and out a lot. Yeah. And I don't realize how much, until after I spent it, how much I've spent just eating out. You know, socially eating out with friends, different friends every other day, <laughs> twice a day sometimes, how much that, that costs. And, you know, a goal of mine, uh, one of my clients I just picked up, um, is a real estate investment ex expert out of Dallas. And so, you know, she really has me thinking like, and, and this is something I've, I've always thought about, but I've never really put, like Quinn said, you know, put the pedal to the metal and um, commitment. I have not ever committed to positioning myself to buy a rental property. And that's something that I want to do so badly. And, you know, you look at the neighborhood you live in, and mm -hmm. Willie, you you've talked about this before. You look, you know, the houses around you. And I've seen my neighborhood. I've been in my townhouse now for 12 years, and I've, I've seen my neighborhood change. And I was like, you know, there's two ways I can 
help with this. Mm-hmm. I can own the property and control what happens around me, mm-hmm. or you know, I can move and then you know it doesn't matter anymore. Um, but I've decided that I want to stay where I'm at right now, and I want to purchase another property in my neighborhood and and, and you know really take on look at real estate as as an investment as a, another source of income. And so I just, when I say discipline in my finances, I want to position myself for that this yeah. year. Yeah, I think that's a very, very great idea. You know, recently, um, uh, sometime late last year, um, I was talking to someone and I said in that conversation that there isn't a day that goes by that I don't have some joy in my life. And that person said to me, you kidding? Every single day that you have joy? I said, every single day I have some joy in my life. And even on the roughest day, and I've had some days when you're in business and and uh, you have almost 100 employees that you have to make sure that that you cash flow and get people paid and you make commitments and those type of things. Um, and then even in my personal life, uh, my husband, uh, he's had health issues and together we have uh, gone through a lot. But even in all of that, there has been joy every single day of my life. And that's incredible to be able to say. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy and blessed by that. And that didn't take the new year for me to realize. It's something that um, I think also it has to do with attitude. It has to do with a word Miss Stewart, our founder says, Miss Stewart Samuel says all the time, is women that are committed. And I think when you're committed and you commit to life, you committed to uh, no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to move forward. And, um, and I've been blessed to be able to, every time I open my eyes every morning, uh, to be able to hit that floor and say, oh, wow, this is a new day. I get an opportunity to do this thing again and do it in a different way. I wonder, what am I going to be faced with today? And, um, and, and what brought me to that type of inspiration that I'm able to do that every day, it's not the good times that have happened in my life, and it's not all those joyous times. It's been the difficult times Mm -hmm. in my life that has gotten me to that point to where every morning that uh, I'm inspired by that. I'm inspired by just waking up and, 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 and just uh, get the anticipation to what uh, God has in the path for me. And, um, and I think we all can have that attitude uh, because I think, you know, when we talk to each other, we think we have gone through some stuff. We start talking to somebody else and we say, oh, my goodness, yeah. you know, I could not imagine that, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, so that's what I want to say to people and I want to share with women. It's just when you reflect at the end of your day, I bet you if you really think about it, there's been some joy in your day. It may not have been something big, but it might have been something little. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think about I guess that's why I love the sport of golf so much. Uh, you can go out there and you play 17 holes and you play lousy. You get on that last hole and you get that birdie and you're like, that whole day becomes a new. <laughs> it's like you had the best day, you know, yeah, when, when and 90% of it was yeah. lousy, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so that's what I think about is if, even if you had, you go to work and you got to work eight hours or 10 hours a day, uh, nine of it may be horrible, but I could, and, you know, if you had one hour that you had something to inspire you or something to share for you the next day, you, you've done a lot. And I think for we, us as women, because we are huge multitaskers, we are doing so many things, not only for ourselves and for our families and for our communities, uh, it becomes a challenge for us, mm-hmm. uh, and and we we need to take that time to have an awareness uh, of that joy in our lives because that joy in that day gives you the energy, give you inspiration for the next day. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, so um, I just want to say to people just to make sure in 2018 and moving forward that you 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 take a moment and realize the joy in your day. You know, I want to add to that. Um, an attitude of gratitude. Um, my mother and I recently, well, we went to Atlanta together just, just recently, last week. And so I got a chance to spend five days, just my mom and I. Uh, of course, we went to go visit family, but it really got opportunity. It, my dad wasn't there, so no interruptions, distractions from him, who I love dearly. Um, but 
you know, my mother is a very caring, very giving person. And, you know, but to see her, you know, I really got a chance to just really be one on one with her and pay attention to her and hear what she had to say and all these things. And, and I know all those things about her, but, you know, I just really got an opportunity to, to really just take time out and be present with her. And, you know, she really has an attitude of gratitude. Like she, you know, I just look at him like, why are you? Why you got to do that for people? And, you know, I, um, you know, I always own her about that. But she sees it as, like, that's what she's supposed to do. And, you know, it, it really has taught me a lot. And just even those five days we were together, I was just like, I really need to do better. Yeah. I really need to do better about, I mean, she was up constantly doing something. Even my dad not there. She was helping her sister in the kitchen. She was helping cooking. She was doing this driving to the mall with her sister, you know, she, she, she found so much pleasure in that and so much and in serving. The, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, that was definitely right on time for me mm -hmm. and helping me with, you know, like Teresa, you know what, you need to do better about that. Yeah. And it's great how moms can inspire us. We, even when they're just doing their regular <laughs> they do? their thing. And I look at my mom all the time and I'm like, oh, I hope Gia feels this way about me. You know, I hope I can live my life in a way that she looks through her eyes at me with the same eyes I look at my mom because she's been such an amazing example, but she's always working for somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, always doing something for someone else, and she gets so much joy out of it. Yeah, uh, She will go out of her way to, to do something for someone else, not for any recognition or anything, but it just makes her feel happy mm -hmm. that she was of service. And I've been working on that, too, to just kind of say, okay, and it makes you feel good when mm -hmm. you do it. You just kind of have to yeah, get in there and, and do it. But. Yeah. Yeah. In our last conversation, a couple of the ladies that we were talking to, they talked about uh, things that, big rocks that uh, they wanted to um, try that they kept putting off because uh, they were, um, uh, they had, they kept saying they didn't have time to do it, um, uh, the situation wasn't right. And one of them was, uh, we talked about writing your book. And uh, one of the, uh, uh, round table uh, guests said that they were going to write their own book this year. So what is it that you all have been putting off that you think you you would like to do and maybe even try reaching out and venturing in doing in 2018? It may not be as big as writing your own book, but it may be something small but big to, to someone else. I think more than anything, I want to share my personal story. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure how, like what the proper venue is, the proper media is for mm -hmm. that. Um, but it's something I've been prayerful about for months, probably years, mm -hmm. even before the birth of Gia. I, I thought the end of my story was 2015. Mm -hmm. And even with that, I was like, I still need to share this. Well, now mm -hmm. there's been another layer to it. Um, and so I want to figure out how to share it in a way that helps others. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still working on that because I have no idea which direction to go in to do that. But it's something that I'm hoping 12 months from now mm -hmm. I can sit here and say, I figured it out. Or you guys can say, oh, wow, we've heard the whole story <laughs> yeah. and can share it with others. Because yeah. uh, I do give little pockets of opportunities to share with random people. Mm -hmm. and so It's like I get connected with people at random times and I get to tell a little bit of it and, and it often inspires or helps mm -hmm. them in, in something that they're growing, going through. And so uh, that's my biggest desire is to just figure out how to share it all in a way that's impactful uh, and that really helps others. And not, my problem is that I don't want it for any of my glory. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to do it in a way that helps others. So yeah, that's something I'm hopeful mm -hmm. for. Quinn? Well, mine is, and I just wrote it down today. Um, <laughs> I want to start my own business. Okay. Still trying to figure out, like I said, I'm asking for God's guidance on exactly what, but I know it will be engineering related. Mm -hmm. So just trying to learn as much as possible, I guess, like about a business plan and just how to get started and mm -hmm. see where it goes. Well, that's what I love about Women for Progress because you have all these resources to help you get that done. Sitting next to you, Miss Teresa Kennedy, who's who's multi talented. You got Miss Hodges, who already has her business and doing well, mm -hmm. and uh, and of course Miss Kamisha, who has a diverse uh, <laughs> information. <laughs> yes, and uh, yes, and I think too when you know that's the reason I asked that question 
Because when you put that information out there and you make that commitment to it, and when we talked about loving ourselves earlier, it's up to us now that we've heard this from Quinn to say she wants to start her own business. Mm. We cannot just hear that from her and not do anything about it. We got to call her tomorrow and say, okay, when you're going to get started, <laughs> Quinn, what do you need from us? How can we support you in it? And, I, and when we talked about how we come together, even getting more women in the political process, this is how we do it. This, this is a person who has, has put this out there, and what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. How do we support her in it? And, uh, and, and, and when I go back to the foundation of Women for Progress, we talk about that little piece again, everybody giving their piece of what they can offer to Quinn mm -hmm. to help her get this mm -hmm. new business launch. And I think that's how we do it. And the women that are listening out there, that's what I want all of us to do. How do we do that in our own way? Uh, we might be doing it through Women for Progress, but there may be a church group of women that you that you have that you all can come together. And strategize. When we talk about strategy, not just for political leadership, strategize just how we're going to support each other. You know, whether it's as mothers and raising our children, as grandmothers and, uh, and what we have to do as grandmothers, how can we be better and stronger grandmothers? How can we have support our families? How can we be better wives? You know, so um, so I think that's wonderful, Teresa. Well, I, I mentioned about the real estate, but I've had this for a long, 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 long time. And Miss Bender said it about writing the book, and that's something I've hadn't told, but maybe two or three people ever in life is writing the book. Um, and the book is really to talk about my dad who I'm a lot like. <laughs> I strive to be a lot like my mother, but unfortunately, I have a lot of my dad in me. And he knows it. He's, it's so funny, because even in Atlanta with our family, my cousins was like, look, WJ. <laughs> but, um, but no, the book about my dad is really the things I've learned, being his only daughter, um, things I've learned from my dad. And it's so funny. One of the things he always says when he's trying to drive home a point is, what, this is what he says. We will always say, we will always say, and my brother's not be like, oh you say so much. <laughs> you know, we all laugh at him. He'd be so serious. We'd be like, I don't know, you always say so much. But, you know, there have been so many lessons learned from my dad on these, what he always says, which is a lot, um, that I really want to share with people that I think a lot of people find joy. Anybody that meets my dad will never forget him because he, he, he finds some way to be funny and, I never find it funny, but if they do, <laughs> um, but it, 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 I, I, I would have so much love for him, you know, and I would love to do that, you know, before, for him to see it, you know, yeah. um, and Quinn, you know, talking about starting a business, um, a lot of people don't take that leap, and so, yeah. you know, whatever it is, like Willie said, you know, I, and I have to attest to just even being a part of Women for Progress. Um, there, these women are very supportive of, of the members, um, and so um, I can remember when I was started Red August back in 2010. I talked about it for about two years, and you know, and but I only talked about it with a small group of people. But then I started telling people. You know, more people found out, the more people started telling other people. And I ran into women. They're like, "So have you started Red August yet?" And I'm like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I haven't. You know, so now comes the accountability part yeah. and, and me following through. So it had to happen. And so now you've put it out there. We're going to be on you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. whatever we see. Yeah. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. And Kamisha, too. We're going to be trying yeah. to figure out what, how you yeah. get this yeah. out there. Yeah, we got to think about how to story. throw some yeah. ideas out there. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, just. I'm gonna, I want to get back to working with the youth. Um, before I started my second business, I worked with the youth at my church and I work with youth at, um, at the schools where I have relationships with people, and I really want to get back to that because I really have a passion for the youth. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And what and what online is that you think you want to get into wellness with the, with the youth? What do you know? What area you want to go? Well, secretly, I want my own nonprofit that's geared towards um, underprivileged youth okay. um, because I was um, pretty much raised by a group of school teachers from Rowan Middle School years ago. Um, they really saw me through high school all the way through college. And so I want to kind of have a nonprofit that's similar to it mm -hmm. um, as my way of giving back to children from those neighborhoods mm -hmm. that I live in. Okay. 
And Willie, what's yours? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, I think <laughs> if you know me, you already know that I do so very, very, very much. But um, I have, I actually want to go back to school again and, um, and um, uh, maybe get my Ph.D. or uh, look at another particular area, uh, possibly even law school. Uh, actually, I have to say now that I think about it, I, I would love to be my retirement job. Uh, I would like to go to law school and get my law degree. And when I retire, I would like to have that focus be on helping women uh, from a legal standpoint and uh, maybe even just focusing on women issues and policy. Uh, so uh, I think that's a reality that I'm, I'm thinking about. But uh, I got some other things to get out of the way first. <laughs> but, uh, but that is my focus. And I, I know that it, it uh, uh, I also, I pray a lot about uh, my future and what I want to do. And, um, and so I'm just kind of uh, waiting right now and uh, just doing what I need to do, what I think is um, uh, my lane, as they say. And then uh, we'll see what happens down the road. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want to wrap up our conversation today with this question. And this is a question that actually Teresa gave me some time ago. We've been using it over and over and over again. It's a good question is what would you tell your younger self? And that's what we'll, the question we'll lead, uh, lead with tonight. I'm going to start with Ms. Hodges. <laughs> I can tell so much when I think back on everything, but the number one thing would probably be, you know, girl, stop stressing so much. You know, just do it. Relax and just do it. Um, and also just take, you know, take better care of yourself. Okay. Okay. Gwen? I would tell myself to take the leap and go follow your gut. Because um, I have a strong family. I love them, but they're very opinionated. So sometimes I'm just like, I have listened to them in the past. And then life has always made me go kind of back to my gut feeling or, you know, my gut choice. So I would just give my advice give myself that advice to just stick with my good. Okay. And I, I think, you know, when we talk about, I, I want to expand on that when you say stick to your gut, because I think a lot of decisions we make, especially when we're younger, we don't listen to, to ourselves. Um, uh, and, and that gut that tells us or that thing that tells us, I know when we grew up, I knew when I, like when I grew up and I'm, I'm old school, so um, even in my head now, my, I, my mother passed away three years ago, and I still hear her in my head every day, and I feel her every day. And it's almost as if she's really not gone, and, um, and that's one of the things that she always said to us. We, I raised you with, uh, to do things that are, uh, you know what's right and you know what's wrong. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I've taught you all of these things. So when you're out there and you're getting ready to make a decision, you know, you want to listen to those things that we already know. Teresa? Um, my gut is telling me uh, to never make a decision based on someone else. You know, make the best decision that is best for you. Okay. I'll just say that. <laughs> and Kamisha, what would you tell a younger Kamisha? Or I, I, younger I think self? I've already said it once, and that's just be courageous. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up very sheltered. Um, I have two amazing parents. They pretty much protected me from every, every little thing, which was a good thing. But I was so naive um, and then very timid in the world because I grew up in this home that was full of love and support. But it was the world is not that place mm -hmm. uh, and so while they sheltered me and loved me and kind of gave me the confidence that I needed it took me a little bit longer to evolve and to say I have a voice mm -hmm. and I can use that voice and impact change and help others instead of being so timid and quiet because I just never had to use that voice at home because it was such a sacred loving place but then there wasn't a good balance so <laughs> This is home, and this is where we're going to love and nurture and support you to be this amazing person. But then you have to go out in the world who's not really going to care a whole lot about you, and you still need to be able to use that voice mm -hmm. that we've cultivated here so you can have the confidence 
but take it outside and make the change. So I think it took me a little bit longer than it should have to get to the point to where I had the confidence because I grew up in this great environment mm -hmm. um, to use it out in the world. And so kudos to my parents. And I hope <laughs> that Daryl and I can have that good balance mm -hmm. uh, with our children that we're raising now. Uh, and so to my younger self, I would say, just be courageous. You can do that thing that you think you may not be able mm -hmm. to do. And so uh, I think the younger Kamisha second guessed her abilities way too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but this Kamisha, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I know what I can do when I'm willing to work hard. But I also know from, from the parents that I had that it takes the work. You're not just great because you woke up this morning. It takes some time, effort, practice, discipline mm -hmm. um, to do all those things. And so um, I would just say be courageous, believe in yourself, uh, and put in the work. Mm -hmm. And were there any women in 2017 that um, you all, that stood out in your heads that you, that, uh, made the impact with you uh, as individuals or you think even it just impacted us as a whole in 2017? I think all those women that went out in Alabama. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. 98%. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, mm -hmm. he went against all the naysayers yeah. and voted. All the women in the Me Too movement. Yeah. Uh, I think what we saw in 2017 was women really unite mm -hmm. for certain causes and mm -hmm. come together and say, we support each other, right. uh, and we're going to use our support of each other to make change. Right. And so yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I would agree with Kamisha. Um, I would add to that, you know, the women who stepped out there courageously and ran for office um, and, and actually won. I was kind of looking into, um, for tonight's, uh, radio show, uh, all the women who were black mayors um, of cities, mm -hmm. and I was surprisingly uh, shocked that, well, we know here in Mississippi in 2017, we had um, Rashonda yeah, from, Beachma from Pilahatchee. Pilahatchee. Right. Yeah. Um, not only was she the first black woman, mm -hmm. um, she was the first black ever elected mayor in Rankin County, mm -hmm. and that's, that's big. That's huge. Yeah, if you're from Mississippi, you know Rankin County, that's right. huge. Um, even in Woodville, we had a, 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 a sister uh, elected mayor in Woodville, uh, Mississippi. But then, like I said, I started looking outside of the state. And, of course, we talked about Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta and Latoya um, Cantrell in New Orleans. But I was shocked to know uh, Shreveport, Louisiana has a black woman mayor. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, mm -hmm. North Carolina, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, Fontana, California, which is had a population of over 100,000 people. Um, so, you know, all those women, and, and then there are a lot of women, uh, you know, we talked about preparing women and training women to run for office. Uh, there was one group that we've, we've been in contact with, She Should Run. Mm -hmm. um, I read an article where they talked about since, the, you know, 40, well, I'll just say 45 been elected, um, the number of women who have stepped up to want, now want to be trained on running, mm -hmm. Um, I think there's not a whole lot of focus on working campaigns, which is something that I hope that we'll get around to because that that, that is a career and there is yeah. there's a lot of that going, you know, campaigns happen every year in Mississippi. Um, so for me, the, you know, the women, the women in Alabama, the women who stepped out there to run in 2017 and, and, and have really just inspired others to run, um, I think that's something that I'm looking forward to going forward. Ms. Quinn? Um, I guess mine's kind of more personal. Um, I have a friend. She's kind of going through quite a bit, and I just saw her, like, just receive it all and still come out on top. Mm. Like, she got her PhD. She had a baby. It was just like, oh, you just, like, super person. So just seeing her just... I know it probably was hard for her. She, you know, we had conversations, she broke down, but it was just seeing her just staying positive throughout. Like I just kind of saw her in a different light and just really, I admire her for mm -hmm. that. So that's yeah. one of the women that I, that inspired me to do more. Right. I guess it would have to be just the women I come in contact with mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Um, I, I feel like I had 
2017 is my year just to cheerlead the other people and just mm -hmm. to learn at mm -hmm. people's feet and I have really enjoyed that time of just coming into contact with other women who are you know from whatever walk of life who can extend any advice and they don't even know they're giving me advice they're right. just talking to me right. and I'm just taking mental notes and right. just taking it all in yeah I agree with you. I um, working with Women for Progress of Mississippi has been an, an incredible experience. Um, uh, I was telling someone the other day, you know, I talk to women and we invite them to lunch and learn and all the events. But when I'm headed to lunch and learn, I'm I'm going there just like a first time guest because yeah. I'm looking for who am I going to meet. Uh, what type of resource and information I'm going to be able to get from that lunch and learn. Um, and the type of women we've been able to have conversations with through Women for Progress Radio and, um, and the new radio show that we have and, and just gauging across the board has been an incredible experience. Uh, uh, and when I talk about us loving each other, and I think that has helped me also because I've met so many diverse women, especially African American women. And that empowers you every single day to see women like yourselves that are, are pushing forward, that are supporting each other, that are being mothers, that are being um, wives, uh, being grandmothers. It is an inspiration every single day. And I think we as women, we need to make sure that we immerse ourselves in, in that type of inspiration every day, make sure we're reaching out to other women and uh, bringing them into our sphere um, uh, uh, because uh, it, it's important. And I think for the work that we do every day, it's empowering. It's something unique about African-American women in the stories that we tell each other and the time that we have together as women that does things. Um, and I just don't think that it, uh, that happens in it. In, in, I'm sure other cultures have that, but there's something specifically about us as African American women. And I think we need to rejoice in that every day and share that every day. So um, I think in 2017, all the many, many, many women that I met and got to know and, uh, and we have brought forward within the organization, I, wanted, I think uh, were extremely inspiring to us. Um, and, you know, I think about, um, uh, when we talk about women in politics, I think about Hillary, uh, Miss Hillary Clinton, who, who ran for president. And I think about the night that, I think even in her book she says what a shock it was for her. Um, I think she really felt that this was going to be a big win for her. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine what she must have felt? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, and I think out of all the things that, that happened that particular night, I said, oh my goodness, what, uh, uh, what she must have been going through and how, and how she as a woman got through it. You know, the next, the next day with all the media and all the press and that, that repeats 24 mm -hmm. hours a day. So it's, it's not like something she can get over it today and be done with because it was back at her again. Uh, for her uh, to be able to push through for that and even th thinking about what she wants to do with her future. I think it was empowering in 2017 to, to watch her uh, move forward with that. I took uh, quite the resolve for yeah. her. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think too, what I, I had to remember for myself is that she has had a spectacular career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we can't let that election be the exclamation right. point for her. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping that those were her thoughts. Yes. Um, yes. You know, after the results came in on election yeah. night. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an extremely good thought, even for us uh, to think about uh, Kamisha on that particular. Uh, you know, that, you know, let's not let our failures, um, uh, uh, you know, be that, uh, uh, that, that just that in our lives. We have an opportunity to move forward and to, and to do more things. Um, again, we've been listening to, you've been listening to uh, Women for Progress Radio, and this is a pre-recorded uh, program, and we have at the round table with us Ms. Teresa Kennedy, uh, Ms. Quinn Brayboy, Ms. Tim Demetrius Hodges, and Ms. Kamisha Mumford. 
uh, at the table with us tonight, and uh, we've been talking about the issues in 2017 and how we need to push forward and move forward for 2018. We are, um, uh, of course, our legislative session began yesterday, January mm -hmm. 2nd. Uh, what are some of the things that we need to uh, uh, look for in, with the new legislature? Uh, what are some of the policies and issues that we need to make sure that we're having conversations about in 2018? Oh, goodness. Well, I'll start. Um, I posted something on my Facebook page the other day um, talking about, uh, it was an article, I guess, some of the hot topics. And one is, and it's very dear to me, I am a product of HBCU and um, if you're not familiar with the Ayers case, uh, it was a lawsuit filed against the state of Mississippi um, due to um, a lack of funding uh, or equal funding to the what we call HBCUs, and that's Mississippi Valley State, all corner Jackson State. Um, filed in 1972, I mean five, I believe, by Jack Ayers. So we call it the Ayers settlement. Um, the state has old quote unquote owes these three institutions um, for pretty much back pay. Uh, well, that money from the state runs out 2022. And uh, one of the things that was shared in the lawsuit was the state was supposed to do a set aside um, where these schools would have $35 million. Um, they were supposed to do that over the course of the lawsuit time. And so when the idea was, I guess, at the end of the uh, 2022, when the lawsuit uh, ends, um, that this, this set aside would, would somewhat have built itself up and have, you know, have become a good amount of money to share among the three institutions. Well, that has not happened. And um, we know that every year the legislature is doing an awful job of cutting the budgets. Um, for whatever reasons, um, you know, most Republicans believe in small, small government. Um, and so when you talk about minimizing the budgets, that also re means a reduction in dollars going to these state schools uh, who've already been impacted um, in a way that they'll probably never catch up to their counterparts. And so... Um, they're looking at some more big cuts this year. And so, you know, cutting the funding is also going to mean cutting the programs, cutting the staff. Um, and, you know, these some of these universities still serve a good portion of underserved persons. Um, and they still serve a purpose uh, for their existence. And so that's one. Another one, um, I hear that they're going to be, well, this is something more on a positive note uh, that they're going to push be pushing for is compuls compulsory um, or mandatory pre-K. Um, so expanding um, our public schools to pre-K um, because they found a lot of our kids just are not ready to enter kindergarten. And now we have that third grade, what we call a third grade gate. Um, you know, our students, it's important that they, the earlier they can get them in the classrooms, the better off when that approaching third grade or taking that test and, and passing on to the fourth grade. Yeah. Or being held back. So those are two things I know that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, and that pre-K is really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, because we think about even our county, Hines County, that we live in, there's such a big gap mm -hmm. uh, between those that are able to send their kids to pre-K and those that are not. And mm -hmm. the number um, mm -hmm. of families that just aren't able to mm -hmm. do that is astounding mm -hmm. to me. Um, and so if we can have that to where all these children can have the opportunity to go, I think it, it will make a, a difference way on down the line past even that gate test when we're talking about ACT and going to college because mm -hmm. they haven't, they're not starting behind. And mm -hmm. I think that's so important that we give our kids a chance mm -hmm. and where they aren't already starting, you know, behind everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um you know, Willie talks a lot, being a small business owner, you talk a lot about workforce development. And oh, yeah. I, I think it, we've all have seen in the, in the news lately about the importance of an educated workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, although they're doing things now, you know, on a, on a you know, for junior college mm -hmm. uh, and putting together programs and funding to support that, what you said, Kamisha, you know, the important, we got to start 
pre-K, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the sooner they can start reading and learning, you know, the better off they're, and the better chances they have of being successful. Yeah. Well, I want to say when it comes to workforce development, too, as an employer, um, in, I've been in the staffing business for over 25 years, is I'm surprised by, I get applications and I interview people uh, over the years, people who have two degrees uh, or maybe even high school graduates uh, from high school graduates. And I'm, I am always blown away at people who are not prepared for not even knowing what the expectations of employers are. Um, and we think, oh, we got all these universities and, and, and people, I, I am just not happy with where we are, our Mississippi workforce is. And I interview, like I said, people uh, every day. And uh, we're getting ready to wrap up. But I want to finish by saying is that is some dialogue we need to have in 2018 about the workforce. And uh, yes, uh, you know, community colleges is good. Um, uh, uh, you know, we got to have pe people going and, and getting that skill training. Um, but we need to also think about our educational system as it relates to preparing our people for the workforce. And we are not anywhere where we need to be. Um, I mean, I'm talking about on a major scale. And uh, so um, anyway, we can talk about that um, at, on another table and another discussion. Thank each of you for tuning in, for sitting at the round table with me tonight. This has been a wonderful discussion. And uh, those who are listening, I hope you enjoyed the dialogue. We want you to continue to listen in to Women for Progress Radio here every Thursday on WNPR from 537. And tune in on Wednesday mornings on WJNT 1180 AM and listen to the Working Woman Report.